Sure, I can start. Um, welcome committee members, liaisons, and members of the public to the Legal Services Trust Fund Commission Partnership Grants Committee meeting. Thank you for joining us. We will begin at 1 p.m. We are using Zoom with the goal to foster a more inclusive environment and effective meeting. If you would like to comment during the meeting, please use the raised hand feature. To use the raised hand feature by phone, dial star nine on your phone's dial pad to raise your hand and do the same to lower your hand. Please utilize this tool to virtually indicate that you would like to speak in order to help the chair facilitate the discussion. New going forward, all LSTFC and committee meetings will be recorded and posted to the State Bar website. A friendly reminder that this is a video conference and to please be aware of your surroundings behind you. A few troubleshooting tips. For those using Zoom on a, on a computer, when on mute, holding down the space bar will temporarily unmute. If you use your phone to dial into this meeting, please be sure to, um, please be sure your computer's microphone is on mute to avoid audio feedback issues. While joining audio via computer is highly recommended, if an individual loses audio, they can call in separately using the Zoom conference number. Thank you. Thank you. All right, uh, could you take roll, Crystal? Sure. Um, Iskin. Absolutely. Michelle? Present. Delkin? I think that was Dalkin. That's me. Okay. Cruz? Here. Lee? Then and Ali. Here. All right. Judge Aspel? Here. Um, Selena Copeland? And Bonnie Melling, I see you uh, as well. Are you attending for Bonnie? I'm here. Okay. Uh, I'm not sure if she'll be here today. Okay. All right, so we have, oh, and then I'll do State Bar staff. Um, Elizabeth Hom? Here. Uh, Daniel McRae? Here. Pauline Cito? Here. And Duana, Duana as well. Here, here. here. All right. Okay, that's everybody, right? Yes. Okay. Are there any members of the public that wish to identify themselves? There's one person, Rianne Pacheco. I'll um, allow her to talk. Hi, everyone. My name is Rianne Pacheco. I'm with LAC. I'm here just listening in. I do not have public comment today. Okay. Well, welcome. Thank you. And Kim, is there anybody else that popped in in the last five seconds? <laughs> no, no okay. one else. Was. All right, the next item is the approval of meeting summary and action items from the May 12th, 2022 meeting. Does anybody have any comments on that document? If not, we'll entertain a motion if somebody would like to make one. This is Dalek and I'll move to approve. Second that. Second from Will. Okay. Uh, any further discussion? Any discussion? Do we have a roll call vote? Sure. Um, Iskin? Bashelli? Yes. Falcon? Yes. Cruz? Yes. Lee? Benarelli? Yes. All right. Motion passes uh, unanimously. Right. The next item is a presentation from Crystal on the 2021 Partnership Grant Evaluation Report data. She's a data gal. <laughs> Thank you. I'll share my screen uh, with our PowerPoint today and go over um, the... Okay. All right. Let me advance the slides a little bit. All right. So... Um, just an overview, uh, I'm gonna give some uh, data points and highlights from our 2021 Partnership of Grants Evaluation Reports. Um, these reports had a reporting period of the, the last grants administration cycle of January 1 through December 31st, 2021. Uh, typically they're released the January following and then due in March. So these reports were due on March uh, 11th, 2022. Uh, as you recall, uh, 
I believe these were also the same reports that um, many of you utilized and, and referenced during application review for the 2023 uh, partnership grants um, application cycle. Uh, oh, Duan, you had your hand raised. I'm, I'm sorry, just a, a little technical um, piece. Um, I believe Christina is going to be chair pro tem, but we need a, a motion for that to happen. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I didn't even realize that. Okay. Let me stop. Well, somebody sharing. else wants to do it. <laughs> Thanks, Dawn. I, I didn't even realize. No I'll move for that too. Second. Okay. And then you'll need to do roll call, Crystal. Thanks. All right. Um, Iskin or Michelle? Yes. Galkin? Yes. Cruz? Yes. Lee? Um, and then. Christina would abstain then, or could she still vote on this? She can still vote. She can still vote, yeah. Yes. <laughs> I'm surprised you didn't vote no. I don't, I've thought about it, but nah. Okay, uh, motion, motion passes. So I'll continue the presentation. Thank Christina, you. Christina, back in the saddle again. <laughs> um, okay. Um, so as mentioned, the 2021 partnership grant evaluation reports were due um, this past March. The components, you have uh, three main forms, your expenditures, uh, activities, and evaluation. Um, evaluation is a required component of the partnership grants. So uh, we, we thought this would be a, a good time to sort of give an overview of what the data look like for 2021. I think a lot of you had made some comments, you know, during application review. So I just wanted to give the overall picture, how the data look like uh, across the, the grantees. Uh, just a note, in case you're wondering why we're talking about 2021 data, not 2022. Again, we're currently in the 2022 grant year, so we wouldn't be we wouldn't have um, evaluative data until until later on. Um, I believe this year because we do have a mid-year reporting requirement. All right. Quick overview of expenditures. As a reminder, um, in 2021, um, the Trust Fund Commission and Judicial Council awarded 36 projects, a total of 2.48 million or so. Um, the range of awards was 23,000 to um, 114,000. A uh, quick breakdown looking at the aggregate, approximately uh, 1.8 million of that 2.4 48 was spent on personnel, and then about um, 149,000 was spent on non-personnel expenses. Again, these vary within the projects, but just generally that's where the, the monies went. And then 11 projects, they reported um, unspent funds, uh, totaling approximately uh, 400, um, 416,000, uh, which we'll be following up with them to, to return to the state bar uh, for the partnership grants reserve. Um, I'll pause. That's a, that's a lot of numbers just to see if there's any questions right now. Okay. Uh, Form B uh, was uh, is, is generally the, the more hefty piece of this evaluation report. We're looking at activities. So what were the focus areas that the projects focused on? Some of the target demographic groups, what was the language access and how did that look like? Then looking at the litigant, litigant assistance, as you recall, um, in the general partner grant application, projects do have their goal numbers of goal deliverables. So this is the tail end of what was actually provided um, during the grant year. Um, that was workshops provided annually, um, how many individuals were served through these workshops, and the number of one-on-one -on -one services. Uh, uh, piece four was just referrals, reasons for referrals, and ge general numbers. Uh, resource materials, that's generally a place where grantees would upload resource materials that were circulated during the grant year. And then six, we sort of had a catch-all question of the impact of COVID-19. Unsurprisingly, you know, it was it was notable, and you'll see that in the data I'll be talking about in the next few slides. All right. So the first uh, area I just want to talk about briefly: uh, focus areas. So this is again counting across all of the 36 projects. In some instances, um, some projects did have several overlapping focus or several focus areas that they focused on, which is why if you looked at the totals, um, they don't equal the 36. Um, just in terms of overall spread, um, most of partnership grant money, as you could say, were spent on um, housing, uh, guardianship, and then uh, family, if you're looking at the main uh, focus areas. Uh, demographic groups, uh, just to highlight, these were target demographic groups. Um, top three that I'll call out, uh, seniors, uh, low-income tenants, uh, and then those with limited English proficiency. 
there's a lot more um, groups on this slide, so I will um, sort of hover here for a few seconds. Great. Then we generally ask, uh, we have asked questions about language services and language access uh, project services that were offered in, in 16 languages other than English. You can see the list there. Um, and then most of the projects offer these services through bilingual and or multilingual staff, interpreters, and or translation services. Um, one thing that we're incorporating into our 2022 mid-year partnership grant evaluation report is more information, um, such as, you know, the number of bilingual staff, like what the FTEs are, are put in that um, are funded by partnership grants and things like that. So hopefully our we're optimistic that the 2022 mid-year at least will be more robust on, on this uh, specific data set. Um, generally, uh, here's the information about language access. And then litigant assistance, again, this is looking at goals versus actuals. And so this chart uh, provides an overview of like across all of the 36 projects. So for example, workshops provided, the goal across all 36 projects was uh, 1500 workshops actual held was 481. So if you looked at the percentage comparing the two, 32% uh, of the of the goal um, was held for the grant year, 22% uh, uh, when you looked at individuals served through the workshops, and then individuals who received one on one services is slightly higher at 54% in terms of meeting the anticipated goals. Um, and then, you know, we have we ask a general question in the evaluation report whether or not the projects met their their goals. And say, so looking at these overall um, aggregate numbers, you know, seventy eight percent not meet their project goals um, as they had projected or anticipated in the twenty twenty one partnership grant proposals. Uh, some of the reasons were uh, the new projects couldn't launch. There were staff personnel shortages. Um, many cited uh, pandemic related um, issues. Um, I think related again to low attendance at workshops, shifting to remote services, uh, court closures, uh, the eviction a moratoria, just to, to call out some, um, some notable reasons uh, for this difference of goals versus actuals. Okay, and then this is referrals, just in terms of how many um, Self-represented litigants were, were referred elsewhere. Uh, total number across, again, all 36 projects was 20,000. And then the split here just noted it in, in order of greatest to, to um, the lowest amount. Uh, about 6,000 were referred to a provider of human or service, human or social services, uh, for, uh, about 4,000 to other legal services providers. Uh, again, 4,000 for a court-based provider of legal information, and then um, 1,800 to a private bar or so. And then form C, uh, it's, it's a little bit of a, a more, uh, we've asked evaluation questions, you know, how litigate feedback was obtained, um, what were some changes made to the project and uh, successful or efficient outcomes, which is more of an, a narrative um, a narrative question, which I, I won't be presenting on today because there's a lot of narrative to shift through still. Um, to just get a sense, uh, the feedback methods, um, the, most, the most utilized were electronic surveys, uh, followed by court meetings, informal feedback and case outcomes, just to call out the top four. Um, again, a lot of options given, this is a checkbox question in the evaluation report, but looking at it all together, um, these are how the pro projects collectively um, get the uh, um, so self-represented litigant feedback. All right, I have a couple more data points. Um, in terms of the number of litigants surveys sent um, in 2021, there's a range of 15 to 1900 satisfaction surveys that were, were sent to litigants. The return rate um, was a wide range as well uh, from zero to 85%. Um, nine out of 36 projects indicated that they didn't um, send surveys to litigants due to um, remote environment challenges um, or because uh, project activities were not conducted due, the, due to the pandemic. And this includes uh, phone surveys. Sorry to interrupt. I don't believe we uh, specified the method of survey, so it, it, it would it should have been interpreted. Hopefully, it was interpreted as, as all inclusive and the, uh, all this all the surveys. Okay. Yeah. 
Okay. All right, so that brings me to the end. Happy to go through any of the other slides if I went through them quickly or if there's any questions about the, the 2021 partnership grant evaluation reports. I believe this is the, the first time we're sort of looking at the information on an aggregate level. So I just wanted to provide this glimpse into um, impact of partnership grant funds. Um, and then hopefully we'll, we'll be able to do this on a more regular basis as we get um, evaluation information. Anybody have any questions for Crystal on this excellent presentation? Um, I assume most of the uh, the challenges getting off the ground and fully utilizing the funds were COVID related. Is that a safe assumption? Yes. Okay. For 2021, yeah, 2021. Yeah, it feels like it was really difficult. So it's hard to draw a lot of conclusions, but it will help, I think, in the future if this comes back seeing change over time, uh, yep. especially, yeah, like that four, 400,000, I think it was in unused funds, mm -hmm. making sure we see, see that number go down and the other numbers go up. Um, I think surveys, for example, would be one where I'd, I'd hope it could go up and people are responsive to that. Mm -hmm. And so. we'll also, I mean, as a reminder for 2022, we also administered the PJ 2.0 um, grants or partnership grant 2.0 grants. So trying to figure out a way to report out all that information because they're sort of separate, but together with the timing. So we'll, we'll try and figure a way to, to talk about that. That is challenging. Good luck. <laughs> <laughs> all right, I think we're seeing our, our next section. All right, uh, we're going to discuss and approve the 2023 partnership grant funding recommendations. Just a quick overview timeline of where we're at. Uh, January 28, earlier this year, we released the RFP and the application. Um, we're currently at this highlighted area, July 21st. We're going to finalize funding recommend recommendations and then also debrief overall on the process and any initial feedback since it's still sort of fresh in our minds. Um, and then if all goes well with today's recommendations, uh, Trust Fund Commission will meet on August 12th to approve the recommendations, which will go to judicial until September and October, September to October. <clears throat> Overview, we received 31 proposals. The total requested amount for funding was 2899034. Uh, the amount available for funding, which is an update from the last meeting, um, is, is 3501079 approximately, um, so 3.5 million, uh, which is more than our total requested amount. Uh, just a reminder that this is a 12 month grant period. So our typical January 1 to December 31st meeting um, and then in terms of the rubrics, the scores ranged from 54 to 89 points and average score across the projects was 77 points. So now let me um, stop sharing this screen. I will um, open the spreadsheet, but um, one of the follow-up items when we made the, uh, when the committee made its tentative funding recommendations at its May meeting was that there were two organizations that the uh, committee delegated um, uh, delegated responsibility to a work, working group, ad hoc working group uh, comprised of Christina uh, and Diana to, to look into further. And those two organizations were uh, Central California Legal Services and Riverside Legal Aid. Um, Dan, I see you're still on the call, so I don't know. <laughs> If you wanted to give a recap, but I just following up on that item before we make any final recommendation. Certainly, and Christina and Crystal can correct me if I uh, got this wrong, but we took a closer look pursuant to the larger committee's uh, recommendation at those two organizations' applications because the larger group had a lot of uh, questions about them and they both scored lower than average in terms of some of the other uh, proposals that we uh, saw. After re-reviewing uh, and contacting uh, one of the organizations for further information, our recommendation uh, with Central is that uh, we should go forward with funding and the recommendation from the smaller subcommittee on the Riverside project is to not fund uh, that organization. We gave them a few opportunities to correct uh, question marks that both the larger and the smaller subcommittee had. And unfortunately their answers uh, were not satisfactory and in sometimes, uh, and cases actually posed uh, additional questions. 
uh, that then went unanswered. So I, Crystal told them, informed them that our recommendation from the smaller subcommittee uh, was going to be not to fund them uh, this year because of those remaining question marks uh, with respect to several aspects of their project, uh, and they did not respond, uh, at least at the time when Crystal sent me her last update uh, to that. So that's our subcommittee's recommendation. Does anyone have uh, questions about that? Uh, would you highlight at least uh, one or two of the concerns? Yeah, certainly, uh, one of kind of, I, I wasn't on the initial smaller group that looked at Riverside's application, for example, uh, and one of the things that struck me in the general committee uh, when we talked about it first is that there was a lot of discrepancies with the math on the budgeting. Um, so kind of numbers that seem to be pulled uh, out of a hat as opposed to being based on reality. And we pressed on those numbers and uh, asked pointed follow-up questions. And unfortunately, the information that we got back uh, posed more questions as opposed to having things become more concrete. Another example uh, that stands out to me for me and Christina and uh, Crystal can jump in if, if they have other ones, uh, but we had asked a follow-up question with respect to how many people that they hope to serve and how many uh, presentations they had hoped to give um, and what those numbers were based on because they seemed uh, artificially uh, inflated based on the actual numbers that we had seen previously. And the response that we got uh, with respect to the number of people that they hoped to serve was that that was what the number was based on. It was just a hope um, as opposed to actual realities or prior empirical data um, or even kind of a, a, a plan, right? Um, because we all have plans uh, and there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, but unfortunately, I felt like personally as a subcommittee member, we gave them a lot of opportunities to sort of you know, come around and give us more information uh, to assuage some of the concerns that the broader committee had and they did not take those opportunities. And weren't they also like a sixth or seventh gear, Crystal? They were. Um, or, yeah. or they were, they were over five years. Um, so one. The, oh, go ahead, Christina. That, I was gonna. That's that's part of it. And just along the lines of what Diana was saying, the clinic hours that they were saying they were gonna do on their paper went way down. <laughs> they were asking for a lot more money, just things like that, and they couldn't give us a, you know, we wanted to give them this money. We have the money, but they couldn't, they couldn't rationalize what was on their paper. Um, and then the communication to, to the executive director to inform them of the tentative like recommendation. Um, you know, the RFP does cite projects seeking a funding beyond the five year, five consecutive years. They'll be most more closely reviewed by the commission in terms of overall project strength and other selection criteria. When comparing um, RLA's project to CCLS, the areas that were um, deficient across the board was um, overall administration, project impact, court involvement. Like we didn't have um, the committee working group didn't feel like there was enough answers to, to move them up because they were below expectations across those four main categories, which is the bulk of our selection criteria. So um, that was a major consideration um, when you when you looked at the two um, organizations. Uh, if you compared them, and you looked a little bit closer. And Riverside gave no indication that they're suffering from some sort of issue that would delay their response. Their executive director isn't sick or anything. Their board isn't out of the country. Nothing. Uh, not that we're aware of, and William, as you may recall, I think one of the other commissioners made a comment that uh, this seems to be historically uh, perhaps a, a pattern, um, not just this year, but in a prior year too, with respect to missing information and us following up and, and asking for it and the response being less than satisfactory. Right. Yeah, I think I, I'm inclined to go through it more here because as I understand it, and someone can correct me if I'm wrong, there is no appeal 
for our decision on partnership grants. For the IOLTA funds and EAF, they could appeal if there was some issue, but our decision here will be final. And I wanna make sure we've exhausted our, uh, our, our grace, <laughs> our patience. I think Christina said it best. We really wanted to fund this project because obviously uh, the impact that it could have in the community could be a substantial one. And I think the uh, a disappointing moment for me again is if uh, in hearing our recommendation, that would be really the time to say, hey, wait, please. Um, right. before we'll you have this meeting. Yeah, right, because this is, this is kind of the last. And so there's been a lot of opportunities to correct this. And I think that the committee, and I know the staff on this committee have really bent over backwards to try to assist them to get this information to us. Um, and unfortunately, it either hasn't been forthcoming or the information that's been provided, as I said, has kind of sparked more questions as opposed to answering the previous ones. Mm -hmm. And this is, is this a program that has been ongoing in a courthouse? Did I read that right? In Riverside? Yeah, yeah River, Riverside Court as its partner. Court, okay. Court. So we don't have any um, past performance concerns other than the ones you outlined, but they have regarding like missing data and failing to be responsive. And, you know, personally, if it was important, I think they'd be here. <laughs> so I, I think I've heard enough. Thank you. So what I'll do is I'll, I'll share the spreadsheet that was um, updated, just a scenario. When we met in May, we didn't know what the amount available was. And so we did a little bit of um, disaster, I don't wanna say disaster planning, but just like <laughs> planning conservatively. So we, we utilized um, scenario one, this was in the instance that we had more than it requested. So we used the PG 2.0 um, amount. And so um, that would have been 6.46 million, or sorry, 2.786 that we would allocate across the projects, um, not including um, Riverside Legal Aid. Um, and then scenario two, uh, which I don't believe is applicable at this point, as to um, was, was that we looked at a, a more conservative number in which there was that we would have to cut some of the programs. Um, seeing as our total amount available is, is three point, uh, about 3.5 million, um, I, I just wanted to confirm the committee's uh, recommendation. Uh, would it be to fully fund all the projects at 100% or if there were any um, considerations of making adjustments um, that they want that you all wanted to make today? I have no adjust adjustments. I can't remember ever doing this before. Yeah, I know. 100% <laughs> for everybody. You get a car and you get yeah. a car. <laughs> hey, William's giving us all cars. <laughs> They're micro machines. <laughs> they call that an acceptance, William. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> uh, I do you need a, a motion to? Yeah, I just, you know, first I wanted to confirm before I put these amounts here. Um, the, these are all the, the recommended or requested amounts. Uh, I'm just making sure my math is correct. Oh. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. I think Probably yes. I have to do this on the call. Um, we have a difference. So if you do the math, if I do the math correctly, um, it will have a, a surf, uh, an excess of about um, 700,000, which um, I believe is going back to reserves for future distribution. Um, one moment. Sorry, <laughs> apologies. I'm uh, having technical issues. But... No, everyone loves doing spreadsheets on live video conferences. <laughs> it's our favorite. <laughs> okay. Yeah. All right, seven, seven, fifteen, four, 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 five, which would be the um, remainder. <clears throat> okay, so no, no adjustments. I'm not hearing any any other feedback from the. Any? No. Okay. Any any questions just about the, the working group follow up? I think uh, 
we're, we're, we're much closer to a scenario one today. So um, this was, it, it, it was, we didn't know what kind of call today was going to be. We just had to wait for the available, uh, the amount available. Um, okay, great. I think there will be a motion. Let me just share my screen um, just to make sure we're agree on the motion language. All right, so attachment B is that spreadsheet that I had. And um, so the, the motion is just to approve the, the list of the 2023 uh, partnership grant allocation recommendations. Thank you. Motioned, so motioned. Seconded. Thank you. Um, so that was Bill, seconded by Diana. All right, and then Christine, I can do roll call vote. Please. All right, Iskin, Bichelle. Yes. Galkin. Is Jason still on the call? Yes, I'm here. Okay, was, uh, sorry, what was your vote for, for the rec funding recommendations? My mute didn't unmute, I said yes. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, Cruz? Yes. Lee? Venerali? Yes. All right, motion passes. Great. Oh, okay. I think we're on our last agenda item. Yeah, okay. we're, we're rolling. Debrief on 2023 partnership grant proposal review process and discuss potential updates for future partnership grants. So does anybody have any thoughts on um, how the review process worked? Any comments on the rubric that we used? Anything that you think we could do differently next well, time? Quick, quick question. I had a D on my agenda. Is there no D anymore? Oh, I'm so oh, yeah, sorry. There is a D. Yes. Oh, okay. All right. <laughs> thank you. Let me get you excited. <laughs> <laughs> yes, thank you. Okay, okay. Uh, these are just some some questions on on screen. Christina can lead them too. But we wanted to take this opportunity to debrief on the 2023 application review process. Um, at looking backward and then looking forward, what are some improvements uh, we can make? So these are just questions for for your thoughts. If you if anyone wants to share. I have so much sharing, but I, I don't, I wanna let everybody else have an opportunity to, to share and allow me to listen. Hey, Will, go for it, Will. <laughs> I don't know, Jason could be itching, you know, just struggling <laughs> with the mute button to, to speak up and I don't wanna cut him off. I'm struggling because I'm just itching on it and just clicking and unclicking. <laughs> um, I, I know Will has brought this up a few times, but I, I feel like there's definitely more we could do to circle back on current and past grantees to see their like how successful they have been in deploying what they said they were going to deploy. Um, and I know that's an area for improvement that has been mentioned, so I don't want to cover it ad nauseum. Um, but coming off of the discussion about the the Riverside, you know, issue. I feel like that's a good example where like, you know, could we have done something? Is there something that we could have done where we could have circled the wagons on that, on that program sooner to say like, look, like it's not, this is not going to be a successful project. We need to shift gears and reroute that funding to a, another recipient who maybe is more responsive to what we're asking them to do. Um, so one thing, oh, oh, go ahead. <laughs> one thing that we did for the 2023 partnership grants is that we included a link to the previously submitted um, partnership grant evaluations. Is, are we maybe looking to, to modify the application where there's more explicit questions within, within the application to talk about um, sort of how the, the project is doing? Instead of because the data, what we what we what happens is that we're we're looking back at 2021, but we're not necessarily knowing like how the, the current year is going, if they're a current grantee, like like potentially revise up getting more information that then, or I'm just trying to figure out like how I can we can make this actionable to for for the for the next time.
Did Jason, did you want to chime in on that first or? Yeah. I cut out. So I, I just heard your comment. <laughs> I tried to undo my video so I could have bandwidth, but it seems I'm still struggling a little bit. Yeah, so so just in, in response to your, your your comment about being able to look at um, like a project's performance, uh, my question is for the actual application moving forward, um, is, are there like specific questions that we may wanna incorporate in the future? Because instead of just linking it to like their previously submitted, um, evaluation report which which we did but we can get more visibility by asking more specific questions um hopefully you heard that this time around jason yeah um i don't have any specific questions in in mind right this moment yeah um i could try to think about it a little bit more to think of i mean will might have some in mind because i know it's been kind of since i've joined he's mentioned a couple times but i don't have anything in mind specifically i think maybe we can spend more time discussing what kind of questions we ought to be asking to be responsive to that inquiry. Yep, we have time. I can just bookmark this for before we start the 2024 process to see like where it would be appropriate, whether it be in the scoring rubric, RFP, or, you know, and or the application. But we're just noting it like initial thoughts because we've, we've just concluded this cycle. Hi, Bonnie. Hi. Um, I was just thinking, I think the other thing that, um, we may want to do is if the committee has maybe concerns about a program, particularly in terms of how it's relating to the court and stuff like that. In the past, sometimes we will identify that and um, Melanie or I can follow up, um, Jason, uh, depending on this, you know, the situation. Um, and and um, I know that I have done that in the past, uh, with Riverside, frankly, um, just to try to understand more, um, given sort of their challenges in describing the project. But I just think maybe that would be another thing to flag for the committee to, you know, if there are sort of things that there may be ways of getting to some of those questions in addition to asking the program itself for more information. You know, sometimes it's about effectiveness or sometimes it's, you know, you're reading the application and going like, hmm, what's up with this partnership? <laughs> um, any other kinds of things, so, yeah. Thanks, Bonnie. What about incorporating what you were presenting in the beginning? They, did you meet your goals last year? Because that's important isn't that what jason was talking about for renewing projects yeah i think so I, I i definitely feel like there's overlap and i don't know if it's because because it's more of a reference document it's not as explicit so there's a way to carry over some questions or if you want to ask about a uh, more um like the current project we we, we have a lot we, we probably could could ask that it, it does seem to still um go along with the definition for the rubric category. So I don't think the rubric category needs modifying. It's more so our approach and, and some considerations um, that the committee um, the committee wants to factor in. Yeah. Because <clears throat> I don't know that we, before we saw this data today, I don't remember an all encompassing, did you meet your goals and how far were you off? I don't remember seeing that before. And that's pretty valuable. And then, you know, that goes to, you don't know why you didn't meet your goals because you were just making up numbers, <laughs> right? Um, I think one, uh, Eric is also out of the country, so he's a, he's a little bit remiss to miss this conversation. Uh, one thing that um, I will note for the future is the project, under project impact with the anticipated service and goals. I think there's some clarification that we need to make in terms of how it's being counted and um, you know, some distinctions is, is this across the whole project, across the partnership piece, what do the numbers mean? So uh, revisit that to, to make sure it makes more sense, I think, to just everyone in general, the committee staff and um, like the, and the applicants as well. Um, I did just want to ask about like the overall review process and just what the thoughts were. We sort of, we've, we've gone through, I think, three iterations of this. Um, utilizing the scoring rubric 
And so any feedback on this most recent round of um, having one or two committee members like look at a set along with staff who reviews the whole set, um, did everyone, uh, did y'all find that that was successful? Any thoughts of like what would help increase um, engagement or, or any anything of that sort? This is just like an open conversation and just wanna make some notes because um, I don't wanna lose the, the timeliness of, of this um, as we're sort of debriefing on this most recent cycle. I, I think I shared this before we mentioned it briefly, but I'd like the small groups with kind of one or two uh, commissioners kind of joining the staff to, to review a sample and then confer and bring everyone back as opposed to one commissioner going through all of them or something like that. I like the small breakouts that work well in my opinion. Um, the, the calibration um, process seemed the initial calibration of everyone reviewing um, the same set of three to, to five um, seems to be seemed to be successful as well as just to establish a baseline understanding um, of the scoring rubric and how it applies. So uh, does the committee agree like that's something you'd want to move forward um, doing for 2024? Yes. <laughs> yes. I have limited. Um, limited uh, boxes that I see on my screen. So. <laughs> That's why I'm trying to unmute and verbalize my yes instead of shaking my <laughs> head because I'm not on video. Uh, all right, and then the other, I, the, the, these next couple of slides, we're just looking at um, the current rubric and the def, oh, Dwan, you have your hand raised. Uh, I just said, before you moved on from um, the debriefing, there's one thing I do, do want to share with you all that, because we've started to have kind of internal discussions about how to streamline like our grant making. Um, and one one thought for partnership is, and we don't know if this po is possible, we need to kind of um, check with the judicial council and the legislature and see if the community would be responsive, but trying to get these grants um, to be a multi-year instead of one year at a time, um, you know, that's the kind of um, the direction that some of our other the discretionary grants have gone in. Um, homelessness prevention or three-year grants, our newest tranche uh, consumer debt legal systems will, will be three-year grants. Um, it takes, it gives programs a little bit more stability in the funding. Um, it's less work for them and less work for us. Um, and I know for partnership grants, the, the funding amount um, has remained around, it has hovered around the same um, and, and we put a lot of work into it. So just, just, something to start thinking about. And um, I, I'm interested to, I guess, to hear you all's thoughts um, to see if that's like something you'd like us to explore more and pursue, but that that's, that's we've had internal discussions about that. Well, I'll jump in. <laughs> um, I, I think that's a great idea. The concern that I would have is for situations like uh, Riverside or any other organization maintaining the quality over time and even if we didn't go through the whole application process each year making sure that we uh, went through the evaluation I did some sort of, of uh, evaluation or review annually to make sure that they're still meeting goals there aren't any huge red flags because I, I understand you know we don't want too much of a reporting burden but we don't want to just hand the money out for three years and then hear back. <laughs> we we didn't spend any of it. Yeah, and and we and and our recommendation would be to keep the evaluations. We think that's invaluable. And I know with other kind of uh, like the big grants, for instance, um, there there were times where um, we didn't we didn't choose to continue um, to fund them for like a year two or year three because the deliverables just didn't meet. So there's language in the grant agreement that allows us to do that um, with obviously the commission's approval. I am, um, I guess I had a few general comments and I'm not sure if I should wait till you're done, Crystal, or. Jason has his hand up too, Crystal. Um, I'll take Jay, well, uh, maybe Jason, if you want to touch the um, master. Yeah, I was just going to respond to Dawn's uh, question about the three years. Um, my only hesitation about that would be uh, potential impacts on cost and uh, escalation factors. So, you know, we're experiencing pretty unique inflationary uh, pressures right now but you know you put in a request and it's based on your legal staff at a given salary mark and then that escalates a large amount and now you can't maintain the program because you can't afford staff at that 
salary anymore or something like that. So, I mean, three years doesn't seem like a long time, but if inflation is 9%, like it is right now, like that's, that's going to be huge. And while our uh, amount of grant money to award may not change drastically, it might mean that the amount we can reimburse for those programs across the board change. Um, and so having a yearly grant process gives an opportunity to reassess that. Um, although a three-year would be fine if there were some mechanism to provide an option or opportunity for uh, any of these grantees to, to request the change uh, to reflect that that could be reassessed somehow. Uh, I just would be concerned about someone going from a successful recipient to not able to, to sustain because they can't afford it anymore given the rapid inflation and uh, labor market. Yeah, no, I think the inflation point is a good point and that's probably something that we should stress when we're advocating for more funding. Um, as to your point, I think um, of like modifying budgets, we, we do have a process for budget modifications. Um, so even without a three year grant or, you know, even uh, if programs at any time in a, a, um, in, in the, during the grant term, they'd like to modify, we do um, elevate that request to the commission. Um, well, the, the piece I was going to talk about was funding priorities, but happy to get any uh, additional. I think you had some, some other yeah. questions or feedback. Yeah. Um, thank you. So I was, I was thinking about this question and the rubric and where's Christian when, when you need him? He, he had so many thoughts on the, 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 the rubric and the process here, but you're not here, man. Okay. We'll, we'll do our best to carry on. Um, and, and my overall thought process was like, how do we optimize this process to make sure we are maximizing these funds for access to justice for the indigent? And um, I feel, not having gone through the, the rubric process twice, that it can work. Um, one of the questions on your slide is that maybe we should revert back to the previous process. Um, and I went through the previous process. I'm not sure how many others <laughs> besides Christina got to. And it was, I think in a lot of ways, similar. We're a lot of focus, a lot of going back and forth, but I think it doesn't accomplish what uh, the rubric can in terms of transparency. Um, so I'm, I'm in favor of like, let's, let's make it better. And I, feel like it has a lot of room to grow. But actually the first thing I wanted to mention in terms of creating a feedback loop of making sure that we're accomplishing that overall goal was the application. And I'm wondering if there would be a way where uh, commission members or a work group after every um, review season, uh, could go through and, and make sure that we're asking the questions in the way that gets the answers we want. Does this question help us evaluate this group or not? Can we eliminate this question? Can we simplify this question? Um, were people really confused? Uh, I think that would be one way we could improve the process and possibly simplify the application. Uh, sometimes there's a lot of repetition uh, and I don't know that that really helps. It feels like they're just copy and pasting. Um, and that they have to because the questions are set up that way. Um, so I think one way might be just uh, as part of this debrief, which I think is great. And I think the, the presentation at the beginning of the meeting was really helpful. And if we can start adding in like yearly comparisons going forward, um, with that presentation, it could also be really helpful to see, are we improving? Are we getting more people on board? Are we making the impact that we want to have? So the application um, is one area where if it's simpler, they have to spend less money on uh, grant writers and all of that process. And if we're really honing the application to ask the questions that we feel are really important, um, hopefully it makes the whole review process simpler. Um, that was one, one thought I had in, in terms of creating a feedback loop. And the same with the rubric where 
I really struggle with the consistency in uh, members' definitions or understanding of the categories. So I see it one way. I can tell by the way another member of the staff is talking that they see it a different way. And then we also have the application instructions and then the rubric instructions. And I think um, it leaves a lot of room for the transparency to get lost because everybody's subjective understanding, the applicants, the staff uh, and committee members. Um, I think this process will hopefully start to address that. Uh, and I really appreciate that. And I think I would add um, making sure the application instructions are consistent with our rubric instructions. Uh, in fact, it would probably be better if they were all just one document. So everybody was seeing the same thing. It wasn't, well, we said this in the application instructions for the RFP, I guess I should be more clear there. The RFP says this, and then the application questions are this, and then the evaluation and the rubric say this. Um, I think the more we can align those, the better that would be. Uh, and then what was the last thing I had? Yeah, and I don't know if it would be better to do a, a work group, have work groups and kind of attack those uh, and let members get in and be like, oh, that's what I thought, or if it's just something we should collect as we're going through the process. Uh, but I personally find it very frustrating when I, I read all the instructions, I do my best to like internalize that. And then it's like, oh, nobody else is on, on the, this page. And I would rather we just, we, we come up with a, a definition for the categories and for the rubric pieces that we can all agree on. And we have that debate before we're in the thick of it, because once we're in the discussion part, it's really, you know, it's fraught because we're now we're biased. We know that our choice in the moment is going to impact the rating for this particular grant request. Um, so I think this evaluation process is great. Um, I think we've done surveys with the uh, um, grantees. I think that's also an excellent way, um, but they're going to be reluctant to criticize the people who are giving them money, or at least most people I know are reluctant to <laughs> criticize. Um, and I think any way we can simplify it um, would be excellent and, and find that consistency. I don't think we should uh, necessarily revert back Thanks, Will. Um, so, so Duane and Elizabeth, I think you're both on the call. Just a, I guess a quick like procedural question. I think we'll we'll see back as as um, I, I understand it. But if committee members wanted to provide feedback to the current application, um, RFP, et cetera, or the other like administ um, other documents, would we uh, would that would it be best to form a working group, or would that be able to? Because it's not a voting item. It's it's administrative related. I'm just trying to figure out the intersection. I think both on the call limited again to four screens. Let me take a look. I think they both actually dropped off. They may have been called uh, to um, board of trustee meeting items. Okay. I was told to 15. I thought we had them for a few more minutes. Um, I think I can follow up um, and just get like in terms of the process wise, I, I wouldn't want to be out of process, but I think it, it would be valuable because as committee members, you all are looking at the proposal. So responses mm -hmm. and the way things are phrased, like maybe it looks different from the staff perspective and um, things like that. So um, thank you all. I'll follow up with them. And also, we're not robots, you know, and that there's a reason there's a multiple people reviewing these. So I don't really have a problem if we differ, but I, I agree that if we could have consistency in, in, in the various forms, that would probably be helpful. But I, I don't envision a situation where, like, Will, you're like, I'm off the page. Well, good. We need that, you know? Well, I, we all have different perspectives, and we're all going to really, apply it a little bit differently. And I think I that's think good. I think that's exactly what I love. You know, I, I got to work with uh, Judge Daskal and Justice Williams in past um, evaluations, and they always enlightened me, right? That was always great. What was frustrating is if, and this didn't always happen, but it's if we, we didn't even agree on what we were evaluating. 
Um, and that that's what I, I, I don't want us to be robots, but I do want us to be talking about the same thing. And I think we're probably gonna be talking about funding priority shortly, but yeah. that's one where <laughs> there is a lot of disagreement. And I think we should just change our funding priorities. I think we're, we're, we're we struggle because in our hearts, we, we know how, what they should be, but uh, we're not currently aligned. We're relying on what a uh, past committee has decided or commission, I guess, or board of trustees who, who made the decision. So so that, yeah, I, I totally good. agree, Christina. I hope it's clear that I don't want robots. I want the input, but I want us to all also be agree. We're talking about the same thing. <laughs> Um, so that's a good segue. Thank you, Will. Um, funding priorities, that was the, the one rubric category I was hoping we could talk a little bit more about. Um, as we can see, like projects that were um, older than five years in the overall rubric spread, they were not, um, even though overall strong project, they, at the end of the day, they, they, their score stuff, overall scores suffered a little bit because of like the, the years of funding, because mm -hmm. our, our funding priorities are based on priors funded. So um, I think just opening the discussion in terms of any recommendation or any thoughts to revise the funding priorities, look at different things instead of prioritizing years funded. Um, I believe with the change in structure, like any recommendations that committee makes will, will be um, elevated and approved by the commission. Uh, but currently this is, we're stuck, we're not we're stuck with this, but this is what we currently have because this is the, the current um, sort of authority uh, on this particular uh, topic, but we're, we, this committee can make changes sort of based on applicability. Now that we have a scoring rubric, does this really uh, gonna garner um, projects that you, you wish to, prior, like the committee wants to prioritize? Can, can I ask, so these come from past resolutions of the, the committee, like where are these authorities? Can can we modify them? This came from a, I think it was from a, a committee from a, a former, like a old partnership against committee meeting that got voted on by the, the trust fund commission. I don't recall if it went to the board of trees trustees. So like, I, I there's no, not even like a specific like rule where these come from. It's, yeah. it's just like a, a thing that or originated. So I think now, now that we've completed 2023, we have latitude to, to, to take a look at this again. And then, you know, should the committee want to reprioritize, we can, we can do that and float those proposals to the commission, the larger commission. I personally don't like the giving such a high priority for seed money. I don't understand the point of that. <laughs> yeah, I, I feel like our funding priorities are not aligned with our mission to in, in improve and increase access to justice for the indigent. I'll say that. <laughs> Feel like we're missing the boat with yeah. these. Should be rural. rural. Can't get any money anywhere else. I think those should be at the top. And a what strong program. program. <laughs> I feel like the seed money is also, I mean, not explicitly or necessarily directly, but it does tend to conflict with the other um, factor that they get more points or they're they're scored higher when they have access to kind of secondary or other funding sources, right? Like, well, if the program hasn't started yet, what's the likelihood that they've got other funding lined up and that they're, what they need is seed money, right? It seems like those are unlikely to be in parallel, you know, at the same time. So the, the programs that are well-established and have other funding to lean into probably don't need seed funding <laughs> and vice versa. Like, so right. it just seems like, you know, it's just not, are we just like hedging against the other side with this funding priorities score? Is that effective? I don't know. I think the hope for whatever reason was that we could let go and they're supposed to be on their own, but that's not oh, realistic for everybody. <laughs> yeah. Right? yeah, yeah. The ones so that need it most are the ones that can't do that. Right, and I think that the, the geographic areas we're looking at in large part, like the, the big programs in the large metro areas probably aren't struggling as much for the, you know, the other share and therefore also don't need seed money. So it's almost, I almost asked the question like, well, do the other funding priorities really capture those circumstances where we would be concerned about giving seed money because they can't get money elsewhere, right? We're looking at rural areas 
where they can't get other matching funds. So they're really dependent on this program to stand up. And it's less about seed, it's more about ongoing funding to sustain yeah. less under or more underserved areas. Um, and then the other question I want to ask is, I think we've sort of been beholden to five years. Like, is it time to say goodbye to the five oh, years? Literally, just... was, I was gonna say that, Crystal. I was oh, like- That's exactly what I'm talking about. I think the whole, that, that whole <laughs> thing needs to go. Me, personally. Yeah, I think in some instances, partnership, um, we would be better at partnering with them by not having that limit. So I, um, yeah, if we were really short of funds, I could see needing that just so everybody knows, like then you're gonna, you're gonna be uh, off, off on your own. But I think in the current funding environment, we, I'm totally comfortable eliminating that as a consideration. Um, one other thing for our older projects, um, as you can see with the funding rate 2021, we, we funded as, as low as a grant as like 23,000 for a project that was mostly sustainable and had other sources of funding. Would, would one of the thoughts be if we were to re revise the funding priorities that grantees wouldn't necessarily be encouraged to request lesser and lesser amounts each year because it wouldn't be tight. So I'm just trying to figure like the, the overlapping and like would that enable grantees to request more money without being like, oh no, we're a six-year program. We should be mindful of the amount of um, partnership grants we're requesting. Um, so just a, just a thought, there's no answer today, but um, just trying to figure out administratively what that would. I mean, um, I think like <laughs> this year was was rough because you know now we, we can fund everybody, but if, if the question really is who loses out and who is gonna get money when we don't have the ability to fund, uh, then that's harder, right? I, one thing that's not on here, and maybe it shouldn't be, but like the area of law or the, the, the people getting assistance. I think we talk about it in the rubric in other places, but I'm not sure if that would be a differentiating factor or if it really should be utilization, like the project's heavily utilized or it's going to be in a place where that service isn't provided currently. Like it's really hard, like for me, that's a, a great one. Like courthouse and the service that they will be provided isn't provided by anybody else in that community. Um, that would be a funding priority for me personally. I won't speak for everybody. Um, being responsive to the housing crisis as a, as a crisis or disaster. Like, I feel like that would be a higher priority than other programs when at this point, uh, maybe it changes in the future. Um, I think um, that's, that's my line of thinking. I don't know if that helps at all. Yeah, I think some of those suggestions you made, well, I think we sort of catch that in an, the innovation optional factor so if that was more meaningfully integrated um, in terms of funding priorities, I think that might be a little bit cleaner, like just for 2024. So like, not necessarily a bonus point, but we're, we're purposeful, the committee is purposefully um, prioritizing you because this is a new area of law, not because you got extra bonus points, it's because your funding priorities, you're pretty high on the scale. So um, that makes sense to me. The other question I just wanted to ask, just thinking about like our range of funding is, is whether the committee would be open or thoughts about having like a, a baseline request, like a minimum, so that we don't get requests, um, you know, lower below a certain amount, like a $10,000 grant, for example, with, I don't know, if, because the funding is, you know, the available funding does vary. Um, if that's just like a $50,000, for example, just like a, a baseline, at least request this amount, and then, um, you know, then, then we'll, we'll consider it. Um, and just thinking about our wide range of funding amounts and whether or not we can sort of yeah. address I, that I, a little I'd bit. Hear, I'd be interested to hear what the programs think or somebody who has experience, because with smaller organizations, 10K doesn't like, as, it's like, we want to see if we can actually pull this program off and we don't want to dedicate a huge, <laughs> like a, a whole bunch of staff and go through all the hiring I don't know if uh, if that's appropriate or not. 
Okay. Um, just a, just a consideration. It was um, for funding priorities. We typically revisit the scoring rubric. I believe the the later end of the year. Um, I think we still need to schedule that meeting because I think this is our last one on calendar. But uh, but we're looking at it and doing like the track line edits to get approved in the um, earlier um, 2023 trust fund commission meeting. So this is really an initial discussion and how we might want to approach. It sounds like. We are interested, in, the committee is interested in updating at least the funding priority section for the scoring rubric, right, for the future administration. Okay. Absolutely. Uh, I would be. Um, if there's an, not any more feedback, Christine, I think we can talk about our last item. Uh, I just okay. wanted to. Well, I, I'm curious, is there, what's the action? So the action is going to be we will discuss this further at a future meeting, you'll come with a proposal? Yeah, for the, the scoring rubric. Um, for I the funding priorities in particular, because I would really love if we could be rid of those, all those, the hodgepodge of documents that, that outline this and we could come up with something consistent that outlines our, our funding priorities, the commission, you know, and this committee. Yeah. I. Um trying to think about what the the next steps are we will we will take a look at it like the actual like scoring rubric um in terms of the administration one thing i did want to bring up is you know in terms of codification we still have the topic of discretionary grants to discuss so we're going to have a sort of schedule a debrief with uh, a couple of the committee chairs partnership grant hp and then take a look at it so i think i, I do want to present what, what what that kind of discussion and how that topic is developing for the committee's consideration. Because whatever I think we do for partnership grant, we do want to sort of streamline across our discretionary grants. So I wouldn't want to, like I said, I'm like, I'll couch it until we I get further like feedback from, from that discussion. So we can maybe try to integrate it into the partnership grants or the committee can, can take that in consider, into consideration. Um, but yeah, it would be later this year. But um, in terms of getting feedback on the application, I can definitely follow up just in terms of our administrative process and what that looks like. If there's, I think, well, you probably would be interested in giving feedback for our current um, current application. But let me just make sure that we go through proper channels. Yeah, yeah. I, I, just, I just wanted. Oh, I'm sorry, about it. I just wanted to make sure I understood what was happening because I am confused about what's next from that conversation still. Oh. Uh, sorry, Bonnie, Bonnie. Yeah, I just um, also want to point out, I think that the committee is going to be seeing a lot of big grants that, you know, for the, that are kind of special cycle that will be coming in that may make some of these, you know, I think that this is pretty aberrant, that um, we have fewer applications than, you um, than funding. So um, I just sort of keep that in mind. And I'll just do the historical thing that the reason that um, those priorities were established 20 years ago, which totally means <laughs> that it's reasonable to relook at them and consider them, of course, is just the concern that, um, the, that the committee also really, A, wanted to um, really hoped that the programs would become integrated on some level within either the court funding or, you know, that the legal aid programs would see them as valuable and, and you know, try and support them. Um, and obviously that has, you know, but it also proved to be a real challenge for the rural programs, which is why there was that exception early on, because it was just too painful to see really good programs where there was really no realistic hope um, that there would be you know, every once in a while they could come up with something. But again, it's also, I'll just say that there's also the kind of, I mean, I think Jason pointed out the inflation issues um, that we should be seeing them. And then, um, and then also, I mean, one of the things that we saw with the big grant, you know, these, this most recent thing where we were kind of encouraging people to think bigger, I mean, that might be the other thing to be doing is to say, I know traditionally we've said it's in this range, but maybe we should be at least upping that range a little bit so, um, so people could think about it in a different way. So I think there are a lot of things that the committee can think about in terms of priorities. But anyway, that was just sort of historically, the thought was, you know, if you if you lock in and you say once, you know, if you're good and you're doing a good job and you've used up all the money, then, you know, okay, there's no opportunity for anybody new to come in and propose something. So that's the thing I think that the committee always needs to consider. 
Thank you. That was really helpful, Bonnie. And I, I totally agree. That would be one of my concerns is that there would be an ongoing expectation for long standing programs and then no new programs get, get a bite at the apple. Um, so um, to try and clarify, I guess it sounds like to me what you're saying is we're just going to be reviewing the rubric funding priorities and not addressing the authorities that are still sort of on our books that establish these funding priorities? The, the funding priorities, like the, this is verbatim from the authority. So any revisions and decisions made, uh, I think like it'll be sort of reformatted as like for proposals for the trust fund commission to accept. Like I, I, I need to make the oh, distinction okay. and just to clarify like um, process wise, like if that scoring rubric and we update the funding priorities, if that gets a, voted on altogether or because it's substantive and it needs to be separately voted on. But my, my, my thinking is it'll be um, discussed at the same committee meeting, but in terms of how it's discussed at the commission level, I, I, I need to confirm um, if it's altogether oh, as part of the rubric, yeah. Okay, I just wanted to make sure it would definitely be coming back as like the big picture and not just the, the rubric. So thank you for going forth and confirming that. Look forward to it. Um, so thinking of big picture, I can segue into our last agenda item um, 4D, which is to discuss and approve the description of the partnership grant committee's role in the Legal Services Trust Fund Commission's functional matrix document. It's a very long agenda item. There isn't an easy way to um, describe this as an agenda item for today's uh, meeting, uh, but uh, generally as part of the codification process, uh, which I believe um, several of you are uh, maybe involved with, um, we're taking a look at the uh, Legal Services Trust Fund Commission's functional matrix. Um, historically, I think Duan has previewed this during the commission meeting. It's been a very large chart that outlines the different committees, commissions, and its roles. Um, I think the recommendation was to convert that chart into a more um, digestible format, which is a document form. So the, the voting item for today, um, uh, would, would be to take a look at what's currently written. It looks like we did have a historical document um, and then make, make revisions uh, accordingly so that it accurately captures the work that the Partnership Grants Committee does. This is a, a lot. <laughs> um, so I have two slides here. This is what's currently in that matrix, functional matrix document. Um, and then this is the revision. Um, I don't know if it's uh, worth it. I don't know which ones the committee wants to take a look at first, the current and then the proposed or the proposed and the current. Um, I did get some initial feedback from um, from, from Eric before he, he left just to get some thoughts in, into the newer version. Um, oh, I wish, was this, did I miss this on the agenda? The text? No, this, this, this is, um, this, this text was not a, a posted agenda item mm -hmm. um, just because the the, this language was, it's, it's gonna be like edited based on the, the feedback. So yeah, apologies. I, I, I didn't realize how text heavy it was until I pasted it onto the slide. <laughs> you don't have a red line version? <laughs> oh, the differences? I had the same exact thought. I was like, can we get a red line so I can see the differences? <laughs> um, the, I will just point out for, I'm gonna switch slides a little bit. So so, so what the, the, the proposal, the proposed updates that, um, does is that it clarifies sort of the role, captures um, you know, um, the committee working in conjunction with staff for the review process. So I think it was um, a little outdated in this current version. Each committee member is assigned primary responsibility for analyzing shared proposals. So that's more collaborative in the, um, in the proposed version. Um, and then also what the committee strives to, to fund. Um, I think it also reorders couple, uh, some, some of the same lines. I think just for clarity, it's, it's two paragraphs, like in, in a Word document doesn't look too bad, but in the slide it looks crazy, but it's two, it's two paragraphs um, of proposed revisions. <laughs> Can I ask um, what what is the function of this? This um, where does the this functional matrix uh, of the yeah this language? 
Yeah, so this this is cached in between um, the larger a larger document that says like this is the Legal Services Trust Fund Commission. Generally, this is what the commission seeks, and then this is these are the committees of the commission. So each committee is sort of going through the exercise of taking a look at what is currently written, and then making sure it it sort of matches um, what the current processes are, because things probably might things might have changed since then, but that it accurately um, des describes the committee's role. Um, and, and like a policy know, manual, or sort of like a operation, like, like a manual? board, like a board book, like sort of oh, like okay. yeah. So it's it's it's. I think it's more so administrative, but we just wanted to get the committee's um, input. I, I'm realizing this probably wasn't the best like method to do this. So um, it's informational. It's not like we're, it's not a rule we're we're passing here. It's just, this is our, hey, our, our welcome sign, our orientation. It, it is, it's informational, like mostly for purposes, but it is part of the codification process that we, um, that this gets updated, which is why it's a voting item. Um, so this is this is the proposal. But I do want to have make sure the committee, like you all, have ample time to to look through it and send any feedback. Um, I believe this was intended for the um, August Trust Fund Commission meeting, um, but I believe it's it's being pushed back. So I, I'm leaning towards. Um, possibly tabling this, this topic too. So we talk about it more in depth and they could give a little bit more background. Um, uh, generally, our next meeting that we have in the fall was is to look at um, budget revisions and carryovers more administrative. So I, I can check the timing. I, I don't want to rush the committee into making a vote today, especially like this is a lot of verbiage and apologies for not having it in track changes, but um, so I've just reviewed this proposed language. I am comfortable with what's in the proposed language. It seems hmm. fine to me. Um, I don't have a red line to compare it to what it said before to see what's different, but what's proposed seems reasonable. So I don't know that I have an objection. Now say it again, who, who do you give this book, book to? <laughs> um <laughs> sorry the the functional matrix i believe it's it's shared um external so it's shared to the grantees applicants and also externally um and it gives it the script like it used to be a really big chart that had here's a committee and here's what they vote on and we made modifications and the committee the commission voted on those modifications now it's a board book i I apologize for not having more context for this. This was an additional item um, that we were looking to address. Danielle, do you have more context? <laughs> I can try and provide a, a little more context. I don't know that it will be terribly informative, but my understanding is the functional matrix that we have right now is a chart that aims to kind of delineate commissioner um, or commission uh, roles and responsibilities versus committee roles and responsibilities versus staff roles and responsibilities. And so it's not a formal rule or a guideline, but it's a, I don't even want to call it a governing authority because it doesn't have that much power, but it's like a soft um, governing document to kind of delineate the responsibilities of the various stakeholders. Um, but it hasn't been updated in a while, and some of our office practices are not consistent with what is in the current functional matrix ah. because it hasn't been updated in a while. And so I think the goal of this new document is one, the chart, as uh, Crystal mentioned, is really large and kind of <laughs> onerous and like difficult to sort through. And so there was a movement in the rules committee to make something that's more narrative um to outline again kind of where the committee's role fits within the commission more generally and so it's not a rule to be codified i you know don't know like the power that this document holds as an authority but it's supposed to be a guiding light to parse out the various roles and responsibilities of the commission and its committees well that was excellent thank you that <laughs> was much better than as they both started to um, I'm actually okay with the language also. Okay. If you want to vote on it today or table it, doesn't matter to me. I mean, one, one thing that I, oh, who, who was speaking? 
it was just me. I think I would tend to, because I know it, it's been a, a point of contention in the past, I would tend to want to eliminate the end projects that meaningfully integrate innovation in its service delivery model. Um, I think we, we do that in the rubric, but I don't think it has to be included here. Um, and then uh, other Okay, let me just to mark it up right now. <laughs> yeah, otherwise, I mean, since it doesn't seem to have hold that much power, this particular document, I think um, it's fine. I'm good with that change. It makes it a little broader. I mean, it does qualify itself as a generalized statement anyway and doesn't have any binding effects. So go for it. Let's do it. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Um, I will say I, 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 I thought there'd be another committee also going through this exercise so that theirs got tabled, but they meet more frequently than us. So if this can just uh, sort of get voted on and the committee's in agreement, um, that sounds good too. So I'll make that, that revision here. Um, and then here's the motion. All right. Am I allowed to make a motion? Some yes. some boards I'm on that chair is not supposed to. I don't even know how the rules work. So I will make that motion. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Second it. There we go. Thank you. All right. I'll go through the roll call vote. Um, Iskin, Rochelle. Yes. Falcon. Yes. Cruz. Lee. Yes. Oh, hi, Joe. Wow. I'm here. I didn't know if y'all could see me. No, I have limited visibility because I'm sharing my screen, but. Uh, oh, you can't because yeah. you're a participant. No, I uh, see him. He just doesn't have his camera on. Well, I do, oh. but or I don't know how. It's he not giving me the option. Like. I need to be promoted, maybe. You have to um, accept my promote when I um, send you the request. All right, and then just to finish finish off the roll call vote, um, Ben Ali. Yes. Okay. Um. Sorry, Joe. I don't know if you had your hand raised or if you wanted to participate on any of the other agenda. I he's think. gone now. Oh, he's yeah, gone? I think he's back down as an attendee, or maybe he joined and he uh -huh. didn't like it. <laughs> right. I think. Oh, Christina, I, I was going to say the magic words in other groups I've participated in are "I will entertain a motion now." <laughs> oh. Right. <laughs> yeah. Let me go pull my Robert's Rules of Order. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Now I've been promoted, and you can actually see me, right? Yeah. Yeah, okay. we can. So now you get to uh, tell us your opinion on everything you missed. <laughs> well, I was actually watching most of it, but I just hadn't been promoted yet, so I was kind of like in the background. Um. Sorry, procedurally, I'm just trying to think. We, we voted on several items today, so <laughs> do you recall which item you joined on? I just want to make sure we're, we've captured. He only voted on that yeah, last one. I only voted on the last one, the one that's okay. up. Just, I mean, we had funding recommendations and the um, the minutes as well, so I don't know. We have to I, joined after, I joined after the minutes. And then the funding recommendations, were you here for that discussion, Joe? No. I, no, I was not. Okay, just capturing and just wanted, you know, in case you were stuck in the, the attendee um, list. Um, so thank you all for your feedback uh, for the functional matrix. Um, should we ask, uh, should we yeah. ask Joe about the, uh, his opinion on the uh, rubric and all that? Because I would hate to miss out since. Yeah, let me stop sharing screen since we don't have to look at um, any PowerPoint slides and uh, we could talk about that a little bit. So my opinion on the rubric? <laughs> well, wow. yeah, and, the, and the process is what she asked. Or Crystal, you can explain. Yeah, so um, after the uh, committee voted on the, the 
uh, funding recommendations for the 2023 partnership grants. We have sort of like a discussion to debrief on application review, what could be, what could have been improved, um, things that were helpful. So any any input or feedback you have, or sort of taking note for now and seeing, you know, how could we modify or improve for um, for the next grant cycle. You know, it's the only system I've ever used, right? Because I joined the committee. Um, I need to move this over to the right place. So I'm looking at the camera. So I don't have anything to compare it to, right? Um, I do understand the objective of, of trying to have a system that that brings uniformity where different people are reviewing different applications and that's a challenge right because to have everybody review everything is not pra practical and so i think we have two options to have some type of well there's there's multiple options i guess one is just have the staff do it all and present recommendations to the entire committee but if we want to involve committee members or commission members i should say in the in the more actively in the actual review, initial re review, uh, and not merely be sort of a second set of eyes, then we need some system. And and I'm not sure which is the most effective because um, you know, I've only done it one way. I, 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 when I went through and I did the scoring, um, I, I noticed that my scores tended to differ significantly from others. And then we went through this process where we kind of, we all talked about it and we and we all changed votes and ended up with numbers that were closer, but still had differences. And I, I think it's imperfect, but I don't have a better system. <laughs> I guess is what I would say. Okay. I'll think if I come up with a brilliant way to, to I, I think what we need is, I don't know if people have seen that movie um, Made for Love or the TV show Made for Love where you plant a chip into somebody else's brain and you can read all their thoughts. That, <laughs> yeah. that would work. <laughs> but, but there might be some externalities, that, that, right? <laughs> Short of that, I think, I think the system is, is imperfect, but probably as as good as it gets. Great. Um, so generally, I'm hearing we're probably going to adopt a similar review process for 2024. We'll have this discussion again before we sort of carry through the steps, but no, no, no like epiphanies as to like, oh, this would make it much better. Currently, maybe after we do this one more time, um, there may be more, there'll be some additional ideas for improvement. M minus, you know, will, will your suggestions for like um, clarifying some things and streamlining it? But the general well, let me, process. yeah, um, finish your thought on, because I actually, you just, you just triggered one thought. One possibility would be to have an initial review by the staff with their assessments shared in writing so that what we get is the proposals and a one page summary, key issues spotted, right? Your, your rating, that might, that might be useful to us. So it, 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 it's a bigger imposition on the staff, right? It may not be feasible, but I guess I would throw out that one idea, something to consider. Yeah, so Joe, as part of the initial calibration process, our staff team actually does meet beforehand and we look at the selected proposals and then we present our scores and then compare them across everybody else's scores. I don't recall if you participated in that particular meeting. Um, earlier in the year, but I, I think I think it is helpful for us to have a baseline in terms of this is how staff like read and interpreted. Um, will you have your hand up? I wanna. Joe just uh, reminded me of something and, and Christina that one of the things I really appreciated about the past way, the, the, uh, the past methodology was issue spotting and then allowing time for um, organizations to respond before we had to um, get together and um, make a final decision on the rubric numbers. 
And I think that was really challenging. And I, I forgot about it until uh, Joe mentioned it, that because we our meeting was, we're, we're meeting and we need the rubric numbers before our committee meeting, it was really hard then to have a back and forth and a dialogue when there were issues that were raised where we could ask questions. If, if we had the time, we could ask questions and maybe it would change the um, value that they would receive or their meets or exceeds or whatever. Um, and I think that would be great if we could integrate that because man, I, issues that would come up and questions, that was so helpful. And if we could then have time to get the responses before then voting, I think it would be really helpful. I don't know how others feel on that, but well, I was so I, with what people brought to the table. Can I, can I just clarify, do you mean by follow-up, like in this instance where we had, there were pending concerns about CCLS and RLA, then we had the working group. I know this, we didn't have that luxury of time for Partnership Grants 2.0. And so we were sort of both stuck in that one meeting to make the recommendations based on like the scores. But I think in this iteration of 2023 Partnership Grants, we actually did have the time for the follow-up. Um, before making the recommendations. Am I, I don't know if I'm misspeaking or if I'm talking about something else for issue spotting. Was that, was, did you mean another instance or? Oh, I, thought was, I thought we didn't have time. I thought we would, we got into our meetings and it was, well, we need to make a decision now based on what's in front of us, but I could be misremembering. That, that could have been partnership grants if I know. Danielle, did you have a? Sure, just, I. Uh to add my recollection as well, if it's helpful. Um, in partnership 2023, we, after each scoring session, um, a staff member was assigned to follow up with the program if there were specific questions. And so we did that, um, not necessarily immediately, but tried to do that before the committee fully met to finalize um, the scores and funding recommendations. Although I will, admit that I don't know if that follow-up then impacted a program's particular score. And I know there were some instances during the scoring sessions where a um, committee member or even staff member would say, you know, I'm out of meets expectations, but if they answered this question, I could potentially be at an exceeds. And I don't know if that renegotiation happened. That I can't recall, but we were able to- I don't think it least, did. No, we there, were, were able there, to there weren't any, there weren't any adjustments, yeah. I would love to be able to integrate that so that um, we're not rating their application, we're rating their intended program. And it, it's a little more of a dialogue. Uh, I don't know what that integration would look like, but I would really love that we, if we had enough time, um, even if it, the feedback just came back and then we did it asynchronously and maybe it adjusted our our responses. But I think um, previously, and maybe Judge Jaskell remembers, I think before the rubric, we met multiple times for this very issue um, to, we'd review the application and then we come back um, once we got some questions answered. Judge Jaskell, is that, am I remembering properly or? Uh, that, that seems uh, consistent with my memory, yeah. So to, to respond, you know, riffing off what Joe said, I think that would be great. Uh, and maybe staff can come up with a way to do that. That's not too burdensome, um, but hopefully gets us those answers that we want. Unless everybody hates that idea, speak up now. <laughs> Um, I just think, I, I think from the, the staff perspective, I'll, I'll just share because um, one new thing is that staff is reviewing all of, all of the proposals as opposed to a signed subset. Um, like in terms of scheduling the, just the sessions to do the scoring, I think in terms of like looking at our timeline for when tentative funding recommendations need to be made, scheduling a second session that that's functionally eight, eight to 10 sessions to, total. Like, I, I don't know, like if, if that's like, logistically possible like i'd have to look, like revisit it again yeah. but, but i understand um it, you know. can, we, can we even do it asynchronously and just say we'll get those answers and then finalize our scores uh, via okay. email or something yeah I, okay. I acknowledge i was i think one end generally we got 
information like supplemental and we considered it, but no adjustments were made. So because if we made just one item, we would have done it across the board. I think we can integrate that improvement um, just so the scores reflect if they did sufficiently address our concerns into the, the final rubrics for um, when we make the tentative and final recommendations. Yeah, I think the reason I think this is important is what, what Christina reminds me of is we have a lot of experienced people who have the different perspectives and if we can then make, use that and capitalize on it to get those questions answered, I think it improves the application and maybe improves the program. I think that'd be great. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, Will. What else? I think that's it. We're just we are at adjournment and we got additional feedback, which is helpful. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> Anybody have anything else to discuss before we adjourn? No. Okay. Well, we'll Great see. <laughs> yeah. We'll see you when. Um, I'll, have, I'll have to send out a doodle poll. I just realized this meet our next meeting is TBD. It was just pending any budget oh. revision request or carryovers. So I think we'll plan to meet later this fall. I just have to confirm um, like if that's necessary or, or what we'll need to talk about. But yeah, I'll, I'll reach out. Okay. All right. Well, have a great afternoon, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks everybody. Have a great one. Stay cool. <laughs>